Mary's year 12. We are going to do annotations for Never Let Me Go. This is going to be annotations for chapter one. I'm only going to do a chapter at a time. So part one, of course, is where we're sort of starting. Um, we know that part one focuses a lot on Kathy H, who is our narrator, her childhood memories of Hailsham, okay? And then part two is time at the cottages and part three is her time as a carer. So we're going to do five themes and these are going to be my colours for the purpose of the screencast on which you see the digital version, okay? So hope and fate are blue, memory is yellow, narrative is pink, loss and grief purple, humanity and inhumanity green, okay? So I'll talk you through each of those sort of as we go. So the idea is that you would have read the book hopefully once and that when you're watching this, it's because you've read through once and you're now ready to start annotating. I find personally it's too difficult to annotate on my first read. I need to read a book through, figure out the story, figure out what's going on and then go back and look at my themes. Otherwise, I stress myself out because I'm like, oh my God, what's going on? What are my themes? So make sure you've read it through once before you start this. All right, chapter one. So the first sentence is uh, talking about narrative. So it's this first person narrative, okay? My name is, it's Kathy H's perspective. It's also important to note that this book is non-linear. So we've talked about non-linear before in class, which means it doesn't go in a straight line. It doesn't chronologically go from when Kathy's a child to as she gets older. It jumps back and forward continually. Um, it's retrospective. So for the most part, it's Kathy looking back at her time, okay? And part one in particular is really retrospective because it's looking back at her childhood at Hailsham. And we've got to remember, of course, that a first-person narrative um, may be or is, depending on your perspective of this book, biased. So we have to consider whether Kathy H is in any way biased, okay, about what she gives us. And I think a first-person narrative is always biased because it's simply their perspective. I want to just talk about a few of the language choices here. I want to just talk about the they and the carer and they've and donation. So I want to start with the they and the they've, which highlights kind of this idea that someone else is in control of Kathy H's life, that she's not really controlling things or what's going on. This whole idea of they want me, they've been pleased, this real objectivity that someone else is sort of pulling the strings, that she's just a puppet and they're the puppet masters. I mean, I don't know who really who they are at this stage. Um, but also the fact that she's quite accepting of this. She doesn't seem to be rebelling against this in any way. She's just like, oh, well, this is what it is. I'll accept it. You know, I'm going to stop being a carer at the end of the year and I'm going to start my donations. She accepts all of that. Now, it's interesting, too, with the word carer and donations because we know these words. The word carer comes up in our everyday vocabulary, as does the word donation, but we don't know the context, okay, for these words. The context is totally different. We know what a donation is. It could be a blood donation. It could be organ donation, okay? But, again, we're kind of in the dark as readers here. Kathy H hasn't given us much at this point in time to go off. We're going to kind of figure it out as the narrative goes on. So that's important to understand. It's not just you who doesn't understand um, what's going on at first. That's a deliberate choice that's being made. I don't know why it keeps doing that. Okay. So she talks about how she was as a carer, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then she says, if you're one of them. And I found this really interesting. So I had two ideas and I haven't actually read anyone else's perspectives on this text yet. I'm just still kind of going through and working out what I think. And so my first idea is that like Kathy H is writing her story, her memoir, her narrative for others in this like dystopian world or that she assumes everyone lives or led the same life she did. And I'm leaning towards this first one that it's kind of written for others because she knows that not everyone lived the same way she did. She knows that by the end of, like, her journey sort of thing where the text ends. Um, 
our first mention of Hailsham, so in this first chapter, we have Hailsham, 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 like again and again and again. We're like, oh my god, what is this place? And I thought it was like a private boarding school, it kind of is. It assumes this prior knowledge about Hailsham in this first chapter, which, you know, again, we're left in the dark, but this is to build our interest as readers and to keep us reading, but this whole idea um, that we don't quite know, like I said, I thought it was a boarding school, we know, of course, that the initial page where it says part one just says I think it says like England late I don't even know my book's literally falling apart what does it say it's not going to go back for me now England late 1990 so I'm like oh it's a boarding school of course we know it's this institution school where these clones are raised and there's a lot of questions still about this and Kathy H kind of starts to paint the picture I've got this mention of they've let me choose again, like how she feels quite proud that she's been allowed to choose, which is interesting again, this element of choice. We've also got the mention of carers again, carers aren't machines. You try and do your best for every donor, she says. So this whole idea of humanity or inhumanity, I think the first chapter begins to um, establish some of Kathy's humanity and we see that humanity a lot in the final chapter, which is focusing, sorry, in the part three, not the final chapter, which is focusing on her role as a carer. Um, we've got the mention of Ruth, okay, Ruth and Tommy, um, but we don't know who these people are yet. Um, we've kind of started at the end and we're going to go back. We're going to find out who Ruth is. We're going to find out who Tommy is. We've got this mention of Hailsham. So, of course, the importance of her memories of Hailsham and in shaping her life. She's always looking for Hailsham. She says that down here, like, I'm always out there looking. Then we've got this description of Hailsham, which I think comes under humanity, because I think when she talks about her time at school and the different subjects and the nooks and the crannies and how she had friendships and gossip and drama, I think all of that, is used to establish the humanity of these clones because that's for me what this book is all about establishing that these clones are or have human characteristics all right they're not they can't be treated poorly or shouldn't be they are um so then we've got this donor that she's caring for at the time and it's about how he wants to remember Hailsham like um, it was his own childhood. So we've got this whole idea that for the first time, Kathy's kind of realising that Hailsham is a lot better than other places. And we know this once we finish the book, of course, that the way they were treated at Hailsham is much nicer. They were given an education. They were sort of um, cared for. And we assumed that the conditions that this man was raised in this donor was raised in sorry were poorer so Kathy notes about how lucky we'd been she talks about the we inclusively of Tommy and Ruth because it's sort of the three central characters that we've got there um in terms of characters you really need to know about Tommy Ruth Kathy ob obviously um and I really think it's important to know about Miss Emily who's of course like the head guardian and the lady that they call Madame as children. Okay, they're probably your five characters that you need to know that others aren't so central. Um, then we've got more of this conversation about what it was like at Hailsham. And I remember reading this, and again, when I was in the first chapter, being like, oh, yeah, it's definitely just a regular boarding school. Because, again, these are the behaviours of teenagers sitting around having a good gossip these are the behaviors that we'd see today of teenagers at any sort of school so we don't initially realize quite the dystopian setting um that kind of unfolds slowly and miss hando's talked about the fact that it's also this kind of idea don't mind dozer that it's this sort of gothic setting, almost like something out of Bronte, where slowly the dystopian nature unfolds, but very slowly do we see this. And then she goes into a particular memory, which is focused on Tommy. And Tommy's this really interesting character, as is his behaviour. Tommy's the one, of course, that throws these massive tantrums. And I'm going to talk about the tantrums in a minute and what they may or may not mean. But 
I think it's interesting, again, with the narrative style here, that as readers were out of the loop initially, like, again, we don't know who they're watching. It just goes straight into it. Um, someone said we shouldn't be so obvious. He doesn't suspect a thing. We don't know that it's Tommy they're watching. We don't even really know who Tommy is at this stage. And, again, slowly we learn about Tommy and who he is. Um, I think over here when we're... When Kathy's telling us about how Tommy was running around, I've, I've labelled this in my book as humanity because I think these human emotions are really important. Um, it's what he experienced or felt. Um, you know, the little stab of pain is, again, humanity from Kathy's point of view, the whole idea that she's empathetic, and I've said she's much more empathetic than Ruth. Um, and then we get to Tommy's tantrums, all right? Um, he shouts, he swears, he stomps his feet. So, again, for me, this is showing his humanity. First of all, I was like, oh, because I remember reading about it. I was like, what's the go with the tantrums? And I was like, it shows his humanity. It shows he can get angry. He has the same range of emotions. It might also show, like, how each of these clones are actually, like, individuals in their own right sort of thing, like Kathy, Ruth, Tommy. They're all very different. Tommy's quite an angry character. Um, but then later in the book, Kathy suggests that the tantrums are because in some way Tommy always knew. I don't know about that. Like, I think his last tantrum that he throws, like, on the clifftop where Kathy has to calm him down is maybe because he doesn't, like, accept what's going to happen to him, that he's going to go on for another donation and possibly complete. Complete being euphemism for, like, die. Um, but, again, it's worth noting because it's something Kathy says, so it's obviously important in that context. Um, and then we've got this mention about creativity. So it doesn't come up too many times in the first chapter, but we know that this whole thing about being creative is really important. And it's only in the end when they go to see Miss Emily and Madame that they understand why. It's this whole idea of trying to prove to the rest of society the humanity of the clones. But as children, they don't really understand why they have to be creative, just that it's important at their school. Um... And the reason Tommy stands out is because he's not creative. So it's really interesting that this is what's important or what might make someone a victim, which is not maybe something that we focus on so much today. Um, and then I think, again, with regards to like the narrative or the setting, all these little references to other authors or to texts. So like here it says it was like he was doing Shakespeare and I'd come up on the stage in the middle of the performance and like how well read Kathy and the others are. It's kind of like evidence of this like kind of middle class that you think they're part of, like middle class education or that they're at this private like boarding school. Um, and I suppose that's the difference between Hailsham and the other institutions is that they are receiving this great education. You can argue what for, but it's, um, you know, that they're being treated humanely as children as children clients the language is quite difficult um and then the last thing i want to talk about is that kathy said he seemed to regret immediately and the choice of the word regret for me regret is a human emotion you can't say that these clones are not human if they can experience emotions such as anger and regret so i think this talks about their humanity i hope that has helped that is just chapter one I uh, will do a couple of other chapters. They'll be in separate screencasts. Goodbye.